Welcome to Calvary Church with Skip Heitzig. We're so glad you've joined us today. With warm sunshine and new growth, spring overflows with the beauty and promise of new life bursting from the ground. Jesus gave us that same joyous hope for the future when he rose from the grave. In this message, Pastor Skip shares the life-changing message of salvation and everlasting life we can receive through Jesus Christ. So turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 12, if you have a Bible and you can follow along. Uh, Let me uh, begin with a story. There was a man who worked hard all of his life, and he saved up all of his money, but the problem with this guy is he was, well, he was a miser. He was a cheapskate. He just held, held, held tightly to his money. And just before he died, he said to his wife, he said, sweetheart, when I die, I want you to take all my money, and I want you to bury it with me in the casket, because I want to take it all with me. And she had tears in her eyes, and he kept pressing it and said, promise me you'll do that. Promise me you'll do that. So with tears in her eyes, she said, I promise you, I will bury you with your money. So the day came. He died. They had a funeral. The casket was in the, the front of the church. And just before the undertaker closed the casket, The wife said, just a minute, don't close it yet. And she had a little metal box, and she walked up to where the casket was and placed the metal box inside the casket. And then they closed it, and they wheeled off his body. And one of the lady's friends sitting next to her said, you didn't just put all that money in that casket, did you? And she said, look, I I promised. I I made a promise that I would do it. And yes, I put all my money into that casket. And the friend protested, oh, what do you, why would you do that? And uh, the wife said this, well, I took all of his money, transferred it into my bank account, and I wrote him a check. (laughs) If he can cash it, he can spend it. That's a clever wife. Uh, She understood, number one, you should always keep your promises. Number two, she understood you can't take it with you. And number three, you need to get practical when it comes to your future. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, being practical about your future. What is all this about? Why do we gather in a stadium and make such a big deal so early in the morning outside. We've been out here where it's rainy and even snowy, but yet we come. Why do we do this? We do it because in the Bible it says, very early in the morning, the followers of Jesus came to the tomb and found it was empty. And we are commemorating the empty tomb because the empty tomb of Jesus Christ is the basis for our rejoicing. The empty tomb changes everything. Now, I know you might hear that and say, yeah, I, I get what you're saying, but this is just way too early to do something like this. And you guys make way too much out of this. Well, let me tell you a story about the Federal Aviation Administration. They developed a special gun that could shoot chickens out. It was a chicken gun. And the chicken gun was to simulate birds flying through the air and hitting the windshields of airplanes. So they would set the velocity depending on what speed they wanted the plane to be flying at, and they would shoot the chicken at the windshield of the airplane, and they would make their calculations and their studies. Well. A group of people over in England heard about this. Sorry, our English audience. And uh, they said, well, we'd like to borrow that gun because we want to test the windshields on our high-speed train. So they sent the gun over to England, and they put chickens in it, and they shot them at the windshields of these trains. And they found out that the chicken would hit the windshield, break the windshield, and penetrate all the way through the windshield. And they thought, oh, this is a problem. So they would try it again. They adjusted it. But every time they shot a chicken out with this special chicken gun, it went through the windshield, went through the cabin wall, and went into where the passengers would be. So they didn't know what to do. They called our people, the FAA here in America, and said, 
oh, we're having problems. We don't know what to do. Uh, can you, here's the results of the test. What do you suggest? And uh, the Americans said back to the English one simple little sentence. First, thaw out the chicken. <laughs> now that sounds pretty obvious. It sounds pretty obvious it, that you would thaw out the chicken because there's no frozen birds flying around the atmosphere that hit airplanes. But you know what is obvious to some people is not obvious to other people. Easter is a lot like that chicken. It's obvious why we are celebrating. Why are we celebrating? Why? Because if Jesus rose from the dead, then this is not a lifeless religion. This is a living hope. That's why. The natural order was reversed. The world would never be the same after that day. Now in John chapter 12, let me give you the setting of this. It's in Jerusalem. It is at the Passover feast, one of the biggest feasts that the Jews would keep every year. And it's precisely one week before the death of Jesus Christ. And there's a group of people in this large crowd in Jerusalem that is looking for Jesus. They're called the Greeks. And the Greeks come to find the disciples and they say, we would like to see Jesus. We want to have a conversation with him. They were looking for Christ. They wanted to spend some quality time with Jesus Christ. You know what? Many of you are looking for Jesus today. You may not know it, but you are. You are looking for hope. You are looking for fulfillment. You are looking for satisfaction. In essence, you are looking for Christ. The problem is you have been looking in all the wrong places. You've been looking for satisfaction in all the wrong places. Some of you have been even looking for him in religion. You won't find him in religion. He is a person who died and rose from the dead, and he is here right now. So they come looking for Jesus. The disciples tell Christ what is happening, and they are totally surprised by the answer that Jesus gives. It's not what they would expect. When they say, hey, Jesus, there's a group of Greeks that are looking for you, they would expect Jesus to say, oh, okay, great, I'll be right there. Besides, I love the Greeks. They have big, fat Greek weddings. That means great food. Let's go. But he doesn't say anything like that. This is what he says. Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. When Jesus began to give his answer, people filled with hope. When he said, the hour has come, I think several people's hearts skipped a beat because they believed he was the Messiah, and he just now said, this is it. The hour has come, and they fully expected that he was going to come in and set up his messianic kingdom. This was going to be a glorious showdown. That's what they expected. Until the conversation took a fast turn, and he starts talking about death and then resurrection. Unless a grain of wheat goes into the ground and dies, it remains alone. So as he begins to speak about his future death, the people who are listening are thinking, this is all wrong. This is wrong. This is not what we expect. We do not expect the Messiah to die. We expect the Messiah to rule and reign and set up a kingdom. And this is going to be a glorious time. But it was right. Let me tell you a few things that were right about it. It was the right time. Notice what he says. The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. If you know anything about Jesus, actually, if you know anything about God at all, you know that God is never late. He's always on time. 
He keeps a perfect time schedule. And Jesus always lived with a sense of timing. He'd often speak about his hour. His hour. When he began his ministry, he went to a little town called Cana of Galilee where he turned water into wine. Remember that story? And his mother came to him and said, they've run out of wine at this feast. Jesus said, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. A few chapters later in John chapter 7, we are told his enemies sought to take him and to kill him, but his hour had not yet come. Now, he says, the hour has come. In a few days, he'll be in the Garden of Gethsemane. He'll say the same thing. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son might glorify you. His whole life has been moving toward this hour. And he kept saying, not yet. It's coming. My hour is coming. It's not yet. Now, he says, it's here. This is it. This is my hour. Of course, he's speaking about his death. Can you imagine living your whole life knowing exactly when you're going to die? Knowing exactly how you're going to die? But Jesus' entire life, his whole focus in life was the cross. And anything that would stop him from going to the cross, that hour of the cross, Jesus regarded that as satanic. That is why Jesus said to Peter, when he was having a conversation with his friend Peter, and Peter heard about Jesus predicting the cross and about his soon death, Peter said, far be it from you, Lord. This can't happen. We're not going to let this happen. And Jesus said to Peter, his buddy, his friend, get behind me, Satan. You're thinking like a man. You're not thinking like God. This is all part of God's plan, Peter. Cool your jets. Hold your horses. We remember when Jesus was being tempted by the devil early in his ministry. And Satan even offered him all the kingdoms of this world if he would just for a moment bow down and worship him. And Jesus said, away with you, Satan. It's interesting that even the devil knew the importance of the cross and was trying to keep Jesus from the cross. So the first words out of his mouth, the hour has come. The time is right. This is the right time. This is it. The second thing that is right, it was the right task. Because Jesus says, the hour has come. The hour for what? It's time for what? He says, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And he is speaking about death and resurrection because he says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Now, when he talks about the Son of Man being glorified, he is not primarily thinking, I'm going to die, rise again, and then go into glory. He was thinking the very act of the cross itself is my glorification. The very act of substituting for the sins of the world will bring my Father glory. It's the cross itself. And then he illustrates it. He said it's like a seed that you bury in the ground. And once you bury a seed in the ground and you water it and it begins to decay and decompose, eventually it's going to produce a harvest of life. And so Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, that's like a seed put in the ground that's going to bring a harvest of life. And you know what? That happened literally as well as spiritually. Let me explain. You know, in Matthew 27, it says that when Jesus died on the cross, all sorts of bizarre things happened. It says the earthquake, the rocks were split, the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. 
And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the city and appeared to many. That's bizarre. This is the original Walking Dead. It's like the zombie apocalypse taking place in Jerusalem. Walking out of the graves. People walking around who had been dead. Hey, who are you? Well, I, I've been dead for a while, but I'm back. That's just, it's just bizarre. Now, we wonder who it was that showed up in Jerusalem. Maybe it was King David. Maybe he came back from the dead. Maybe John the Baptist came back, you know, holding his head. Maybe Elijah the prophet came. Every year at Passover, they keep a chair in the Jewish Passover open for the prophet Elijah. And maybe he showed up at one or two of those events and said, Hello, it's me. Now, why did all this happen? The graves opening, people walking out from the dead. Why did it happen? What's the purpose of these dead men walking in the city? It was a demonstration that Jesus conquered death, not just for himself, but for other people as well. He conquered death and promised resurrection for everyone who believes in him. You might call this a preview of coming attractions, a preview of our future resurrection. Remember, Jesus predicted, the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Boy, that's an understatement. This is what you can expect in your future. The Bible says the dead in Christ will rise. But there's more. There's more. His physical death, the seed going into the ground, will result not just in that momentary physical life that happened in Jerusalem, but it will result in many people's spiritual life. If you ever hold in your hand a kernel of wheat or a few kernels of wheat in your hand, you might not see the potential until you plant it. And when you put that seed in the ground, in its tomb, so to speak, it will eventually come forth from its encasement as a resurrected plant. And so he says, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground. A lot of you I know are into wheat. When you go to a restaurant, you say, uh, I'd like that on wheat bread, please. I'd like that on whole wheat bread, please. And uh, we're more health conscious these days. Wheat is a complex carbohydrate. It's used for food because it's low in fat, high in fiber. Good thing to put in your diet. It's used in breads, pastas, cereals, crackers, bagels. But it's also used as particle board for kitchen cabinets, for paper products, for hair conditioner for making golf tees, for adhesive on postage stamps, for water-soluble ink, and for medical swabs. All of that comes from wheat. It has enormous potential. One single bushel of wheat can produce 42 commercial-sized loaves of bread, or 45 boxes of cereal, or 42 pounds of pasta, or 210 servings of spaghetti. That's a lot of spaghetti. One acre of wheat can produce 1,500 loaves of bread. So what did Jesus mean by this? Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. This is what it means. Jesus died and rose from the dead, and I'm looking at lots of grain right now. I'm looking at a lot of fruit right now. Now listen, look up here. If you let him, if you let him, he will plant his life in you today. If you let him. If you let him, you can leave here today fully alive, fully
fully alive and part of the harvest. If you let him, his death will bring you life. But you have to let him. And I want you to get prepared to do that. At this stadium event every year, we make a big deal out of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But we also make a big deal about people who make a decision to let the resurrected life of Christ live in and through them. And if you've never made that decision, you get ready in a few minutes to do that. Jesus was crucified. He did die. He was put in the ground, but only for a few days. When he got back up, he started producing much grain, and that fruit has gone on for 2,000 years. You say, Skip, is he really alive? Is he truly alive? Did he really rise from the dead? Well, let me ask you this. If he didn't rise from the dead, who rolled the stone away? If he didn't rise from the dead, who overpowered the Roman guards? You know, it was capital punishment for a Roman guard if he fell asleep and let something happen to what he was guarding. So who overpowered the guards? The fishermen with their nets? If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then who appeared to the disciples? If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, what happened to Saul of Tarsus, who got radically converted? If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then who changed my life? And who changed your life? Yes, Jesus died. He died and he stayed dead for a few days, but only a few days. Only a few days. He is alive and he's here right now. You know, when I travel to different places, um, if I have extra time, I know this sounds weird, but I like to visit graveyards, especially in European countries, because they've got like the coolest looking graveyards. And They'll write on the tombstone. Sometimes I'll put like paragraphs of thought on a tombstone. I like to read them. I like to read what was important to that person. And sometimes you come across something that's kind of funny. These are registered tombstones. One from Niagara Falls, Canada reads, Here lies the body of Jonathan Blake, who stepped on the gas instead of the brake. Okay, well, that's the cause of death, but why would you put that on a tombstone? Here's one from Edinburgh, Scotland. This is the tomb of a local dentist, and it reads this, Stranger, tread this ground with gravity. Dentist Brown is filling his last cavity. <laughs> and then here's one from Ruidoso, New Mexico. Here lies Johnny Yeast. Pardon me for not rising. <laughs> All funny little tombstone sayings. I suppose if we were to add something kitschy to Jesus' tomb, it would read this, Don't worry, I'm just borrowing this for the weekend. <laughs> he just needed it for a few days. He just needed it for a few days. And this is what he is predicting. Unless a grain of wheat goes into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it will bear much fruit. So it's the right time. His hour had come. It's the right task. Death, burial, resurrection. There's a third thing that is right. The right trade. The right trade. Jesus now speaks of trading one kind of life for another kind of life. And that's the deal I want to make you today. I want you to trade something in. I want you to trade your old way of life for a new way of life. Listen to what Jesus says right after that. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, let, or my Father will honor him. Now, Jesus takes the principle of death and resurrection, 
of giving up his life to produce fruit, he takes that principle and he applies it to the crowd. And here's the application. Jesus is saying to you, I'm willing to die for you. Are you willing to live for me? I'm willing to die for you. Are you willing to live for me? He who loves his life will lose it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. What does that mean, hate your life? Does that mean you're supposed to get up every morning and growl and say, I hate my life. I just want to die and go to heaven. That's no way to live, friend. It doesn't mean that. This is a Jewish expression. To say I hate means I prefer something else over that other thing. And so they're put it in very stark terms. To hate your life simply means aim for eternal life even more than physical life. If you do that, you will live forever. It's a principle in Scripture. It's a paradoxical principle. We live by dying. Your potential will never be reached in life until you die to yourself. Die to yourself. Be willing to put all of you in the background and make much of Jesus in your life. Turn to Him. Live for Him. He died for you. Live for Him. There was a, a man over 100 years ago. His name was George Mueller. He was a very influential um, uh, philanthropic gentleman who educated children in England in the 1800s. Somebody asked him, what is the secret of your life? You're so successful and you're so fruitful in ministry. What's the secret of your life? He said this, there was a day when I died. I died to George Mueller. I died to his opinions. I died to his preferences, his tastes, and his will. I even died to the approval of all of his friends. Die to yourself. Live for him. That's a basic principle in Scripture. When you die, that's when you live. If you want a full life, if you want a satisfying life, be willing to lay your life down and live for Him. Be born again. Be resurrected with His life in you. Now, you might leave this stadium today, and you might decide not to receive Christ. Because I'm going to give an invitation in just a couple of minutes. And I'm going to invite people down on the field to say yes to Jesus or rededicate. Now, you might leave. You've heard this before. And you might leave today and you, you decide not to do that. And as you leave, you might feel great, like nothing really changed as a result. Yeah, I've heard this stuff before. No big deal. I've got plenty of time. But it's possible that for all eternity, you're going to regret the rejection of what is offered to you. Because, friend, listen, in a hundred years, in a thousand years, in 10,000 years, a lot of things are not going to matter. In a thousand years, it's not going to matter if you had to get a, um, a parking space far away at the Easter sunrise service or you got a really good parking space. It's not going to matter. It's not going to matter if you graduated from college or you didn't make it. It's not going to matter if, um, if you got that job or didn't get that job or that opportunity or not that opportunity. Those things won't matter. What will matter in a thousand years, in 10,000 years, is what you did with the person of Jesus Christ who died and rose again and is offering to change your life and give you a resurrected life. It's a matter of making a choice, a decision. And I want you to think long and hard about it. But don't think too long and too hard. Just in a moment, I want you to get up and get ready to come and pray and say yes to Jesus ruling and reigning over your life. I was 18 years old when I gave my life to the Lord. And I remember at that time, I was sort of struggling with what I was doing and this decision. And I read a Bible somebody gave me. And it was in a very simple easy to understand version. I was reading the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. 
And Jesus put it this way in that translation, happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. God will satisfy them fully. Blessed are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. God will satisfy them fully. I I remember reading that. Stop me dead in my tracks. And for the first time in my life, I had to be honest and say, my greatest desire has not been to do what God requires. My greatest desire up to this point is to do what I want to do, to do everything to make me happy. You won't be really happy until you say no to yourself and yes to Him. Unless you die to the old you and say yes to Him. Real joy. You say, Skip, what do I have to do? You have to first realize that you need Him. You need Him. You need to realize that you need Him. You have to realize that you are a sinner. The Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That doesn't mean all have sinned except you. We've all done it. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And God is not going to grade on a curve. He's not going to say, well, you're not as bad as that guy. No, God will judge sin. We've all sinned. You have to realize that. Second, you have to recognize that Jesus died for you. And if you have ever doubted God's love, then in your mind's eye, look to the cross right now and see Jesus dying there for you. That's how much He loved you. Recognize He died for you. Third, repent of your sin. That's a good old Bible word. You don't hear this word much these days, do you? Repent means to turn around, change your mind, go in a different direction, make a U-turn. It doesn't just mean I'm sorry for my sin. It means I'm sorry enough to stop and turn around and turn my life over to Him. And then you need to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. You need to receive Him. You can't do this on your own. Some of you right now are already fighting this off. You're thinking, I'm not going down. I'm not going on that field. I'm not going to walk forward. Not me. And you're, you're feeling a spiritual battle. You need to receive Jesus Christ. The Bible says, as many as received Him, to them He gave the power to become children of God. He'll make you a son or a daughter of the living God. And then there's something else I want to add to this. You need to do it publicly. Jesus called people publicly. He would walk up to people on the street and say, follow me. And they would leave what they were doing and they would follow him publicly. I think it settles something in your own heart when you are willing to make a public stand for Jesus Christ. Well, this is a wonderful day. Sun's out. It's not windy. You know, I was reading the weather reports before. They said, oh, it's going to be horrible on Sunday. Yesterday, I met somebody at a restaurant. He said, oh, it's going to be horrible tomorrow. I said, no, it's going to be perfect. (laughs) This is pretty perfect. But let me tell you why else this is a wonderful time and why this is a wonderful day. Because there's still time for you to make a decision. You have time right now, right now. That's why it's wonderful. You still have time. You may not have time after this. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to scare you and say you're going to like die today. But you just might. I just might. We never know when the end is. We never know when we're going to die. I've been a pastor a long time. I've seen people that I thought would live for many, many years suddenly die. It's time to settle this Jesus thing now, here and now. It's time to settle this God thing, this decision thing, right here, right now. Some of you have never done this publicly. Some of you have been raised in churches all around this community, some fine churches. But it's been a religion to you. You've never said personally yes to Jesus. I want to give you the opportunity to do exactly that. As we sing this last song, I want you to get up right now from your seat. Get up and come on this field. And when you're down on this field, I'm going to lead you in a prayer to say yes to Jesus. Come right now.
home Child of weakness Watch and pray Find in me Thine own in all Jesus paid it all Awesome Just Come stand right up here Right here Come on. Stand right up here. Come come right up to the front of the platform. I'm going to ask everybody who's in the um, who's in the audience, don't leave. Pray, pray. Ask God to move on the hearts of people around you. Look what's happening. What's happening is people who have come have listened to a message, and they've decided I'm not going to fight God any longer. I'm not going to wrestle with God any longer. I'm going to surrender my life to Him. I'm going to let Him in. I'm going to give Him control of my life. So awesome. So many of you coming this way. Come on, we'll make room for you. Squeeze in a little tighter. Do you mind? Love it. Jesus paid it all. It's all to live my own. Yeah. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. We'll make room for you. We'll make room. Let's make a little more room this way. Do you realize some of you are still watching this? You know that you should be down here. Do you realize this has been tailor-made for you? This is God's way of saying, I see you, I know you, I love you, I want you. You've got everything to gain. You've got nothing to lose by giving your life to Jesus. question how many of you who are in front of this platform how many of you came because you were invited by somebody raise your hand if you were invited by somebody today 
Awesome. So many of you. Now you know why you were invited. We had ulterior motives. We wanted to see you saved. We wanted to see you forgiven. We wanted to see you on your way to heaven. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer. You ready to pray? I want you to pray these words from your heart. Mean them as you say them. It's you talking to God. That's all this is. So let's pray. Say, say this, Lord, I give you my life. I know that I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I believe in Jesus. I believe he died on a cross. I believe he rose from the dead. I turn from my sin. I turn from my past. I receive Jesus as Savior. I want to follow him as Lord. Help me in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for this message from Calvary Church with Skip Heitzig. We would love to know how this teaching impacted you. Share your story with us. Email mystory at calvarynm.church. And if you'd like to support this Bible teaching ministry with a financial gift, visit calvarynm.church give.